the Jewish people have played a outsized role in world history for three millennia, far greater than our numbers. We have contributed immensely to the societies of which we have been a part. Indeed, never have so few contributed so much to so many and yet suffered so grievously in the process. Twice exiled from our homeland, scattered to the four corners of the world, subject to the grossest forms of discrimination in country after country and century after century, culminating in our own time in the Holocaust in which two-thirds of what had been the center of Jewish life in the world in Europe was destroyed, a third of the total Jewish population. By any measure, any other people would have disintegrated long ago, but we've been held together by an attachment to our ancient scriptures, although we may interpret them in different ways today, by a dream of returning to that homeland from which we were exiled, and by an almost mystical sense of peoplehood in which wherever we travel, if we meet fellow Jews, we feel an immediate chemistry. Far from disintegrating, as we might have, there's been an enormous renaissance in Jewish life in the 21st century. We have a third Jewish commonwealth stronger than any of the previous Jewish states, and indeed one of the strongest nation states to small, despite its small size in the world. We've achieved in the diaspora what we've dreamed of for millennia, fully integrated, fully accepted, able to express ourselves without fear of persecution. We're 2% of the population in this country and 36% of the US Nobel Peace Prize winners. But now, in the 21st century, with this success, come new challenges. And I want to deal with those challenges in two dimensions. First, a set of global challenges, and then conclude by talking about internal challenges. I want to address several global challenges, the first of which is the historic shift of power and influence from the United States and Europe, from the countries of the West to the countries of the East and the South. That is, from countries with sizable Jewish populations, shared Western values, to countries with tiny or non-existent Jewish communities, and a very different set of values and interests. Anything that diminishes the influence of the United States immediately has an impact on Israel, which is an, the only ally, and I can tell you this for certain through my diplomatic career, there's only one country in the world that is an ally of Israel, and that's the United States. And anything that diminishes our influence diminishes Israel's security and threatens our own security and the security of Jews around the world. We have been in the United States the ballast since the end of World War II for global stability, for tolerance, for the projection of democracy, for the protection of minorities. And so this is a very profound historical set of forces, most evident in the rise of China. China is now the number one holder of foreign reserves, including our own dollars, the number one producer of everything from cars and steel and aluminum to wind turbines and solar panels, and almost laughingly recently surpassed Italy is the number one producer of violins. This shift of power is unique in two respects. The first is that we in the United States have always been 
throughout our history, the ascending power. We weren't always the most powerful country, obviously, at the start, but we were always ascending until by the end of World War II, we were the preeminent power, and by the end of the Cold War, the true global power in the world. And what's happened now is that we are no longer an ascending power. Other countries are ascending. China, again, being one, but only one. And that's the second unique feature of this transfer of power. Historically, there have always been shifts of power from one country to the next. You know, from Spain to the Dutch and the Dutch to the British. And these usually occurred when there were great battles, like the Battle of Trafalgar or, uh, or, or other great wartime battles. But what's different about the shift of power in the 21st century is the simultaneous rise of so many new powers at the same time. Brazil and Russia, India and China, Indonesia, Turkey, Mexico, all of these countries are ascending and closing our gap in every field and asserting their own day in the sun, less willing to be under our thumb, making it more difficult for us, as we see in current events, to rally a consensus of countries to promote U.S. national security, which is often also the security of the state of Israel. So to give you a sort of concrete anecdote, 2012, last year, was the first time that more than 50% of total global growth, called GDP, came from emerging and developing countries, not from the established democracies. And now we have an institution called the G20, which includes many of these countries, rather than the G7, the industrial countries. But I want to put this in context, because with the undoubted shift of influence, with the undoubted narrowing of power, which we are partially responsible for ourselves, we belong, as now does Israel, to an organization called the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. There are about 30 industrial democracies. We're 27th in science accomplishment and 25th in math. We're falling behind in the very areas that are going to be so critical in the 21st century. We must do more, and when we look at what's happened in the city from which I came to see you in Washington, we find paralysis and an inability to deal with our fundamental issues. Having said that, I don't want to paint too gloomy a picture because we're not like the UK or Great Britain was after World War II, depleted, exhausted, a beached whale. That is not the United States today. Even with all our problems, even with the shift of power, we remain incredibly creative. We have great universities at which, as I speak, there are 100,000 Chinese students learning today. A majority of the Politburo's children or grandchildren are here. And the technology which flows from Silicon Valley and other areas is really the spark for the world. In addition, we sometimes think that other countries like China have no problems of their own. The fact is that China has enormous problems. It's an aging society more than we have with their one-child policy. There were 100,000 demonstrations against environmental uh, degradation and corruption in the Communist Party. They're going to have trouble keeping their lid on their people in an internet era, which I'll talk about in a minute. So don't think that they have it all good and we have it all bad. That's not the case. Plus, there is one unexpected game changer. It won't totally change the shift of power, but it can arrest it to some degree, and that's something that 
Even five years ago, I would have been laughed off the stage if I had mentioned, and that is energy, because we know that we have been, you know, like a heroin addict addicted to OPEC oil and how it's influenced our foreign policy. We now have found through American technology called fracking or hydraulic and horizontal drilling, enormous amounts of natural gas in shale from upper New York State all the way down to Texas, and heavy oil in these rocks in North Dakota, which is estimated to have more oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. And within five years, we will be net exporters of natural gas because natural gas is cheap and environmentally sound, we're now finding companies like Apple moving plants from China as their labor rates go up back to the United States to take advantage of inexpensive energy. If you look at the new energy map, it's not in the Middle East. It's in Canada with their tar sands and ourselves with our shale and in deep water reservoirs in Brazil, our energy future is an enormously promising thing which will reduce our current account deficit and help make us energy secure. And interestingly, it also applies to, inter to Israel. You know, we all grew up in an era where the joke was Moses took the wrong turn in the desert. Well, maybe he didn't because an American energy company based in Houston called Noble Energy has found three large reserves off the Israeli Mediterranean coast, the most recent in 2010, properly called the Leviathan Field, and it's the third largest natural gas field anywhere in the world in the last decade. And this is going to mean that in Israel, which has been dependent on natural gas from Egypt, and one hardly needs to talk about the problems there, will be able to be self-sufficient in natural gas very shortly. And Israel also recognizes this shift of influence. And certainly it's not abandoning its relationship with the U U.S. in any way, quite the contrary. But it's deepening its trade ties in measurable ways with China, multi-billion dollar trade relationships. It's the third largest supplier of military equipment to India, another one of the rapidly growing countries. So Israel also is adapting to this new world, but it is a new world. And we have to recognize that we just don't have the influence, particularly in the Middle East, more on that in a minute, that we had before. The second major global force is globalization itself, which I define as the rapid movement of money, people, products, and services across national lines with the click of a mouse. And this globalization is powered by the digital revolution, which is changing the way we talk to each other, communicate with our kids, the way we teach, the way we learn, in as profound a way as the invention of the Gutenberg printing press changed society 500 years ago. Nothing has stayed the same, and it's moving at the speed of light. And we all see it in our everyday lives. Now, there are downsides to globalization, and I could spend a whole night talking about them income inequalities which occur because globalization requires high educational skills and those that don't have it are falling further and further behind in this country and elsewhere. The fact that terrorist groups have the same access as others to cyber and internet and they can use this, this to recruit, to finance, and to plan terrorist attacks. Cyber attacks can bring down whole societies, including ours. Everything, lights, water systems, chemical plants, are powered by computers. And with the incredible hacking that's going on now, they can be disabled almost overnight. There is a new cyber command in the Pentagon with a three-star general to defend our own infrastructure and affirmatively look at ways that we can use cyber attacks if we have to. But I want to suggest to you that with these potential dark sides of globalization, that globalization is an enormous net positive for the Jewish people in Israel. 
It's created for the first time a truly integrated, mutually dependent world. I mean, let's think about the products that we use every day. I may be the last person to use a Blackberry. Everybody probably has their iPhone. But think of your iPhone or your iPad. You say, well, it's made in China. No, it's assembled in China. Less than 10% of the value of an iPhone is Chinese. It requires seven different countries to put parts in to sell this worldwide product, and that's true of everything we use. We are completely mutually dependent, so traditional conflicts can't occur because countries would be shooting themselves in the foot, denying themselves the very products they need to transact business. And that's a good thing. It creates, with all the headlines, a much more stable environment and anything that creates stability, in my estimation, is good for Jews. But there's a more important reason why globalization is important and good for us, and that is in the 21st century, success will come not from the power of the muscle, but from the power of the brain. This is truly an education century, and we are and have been the people of the book. It's built into our DNA, the very characteristics necessary to survive in a globalized world. Adaptability, flexibility, entrepreneurial ability, educational ability is built into our whole mechanism over 3,000 years. It's not coincidental that in the United States today, 85% of college-age Jewish kids are getting higher education, and that's more than double the figure for the general community, and the same is true in Israel. This country of seven million people has eight universities and 20 colleges. And that will pay rich dividends for us in the 21st century. The third global force is of more trouble. And this is the question of the direction of the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. 1.6 billion Muslims and a total population of the world of seven billion. And the direction that the Muslim world takes will speak volumes about the kind of world we have and the kind of relationships we will have as Jews and with respect to the state of Israel. Now, I wanna say something that perhaps will be somewhat of a surprise. I think it's very important and I've traveled widely during the, my government work and since in the Arab Middle East and in other Muslim countries like Indonesia. It's important that we not look at our relationship with the Muslim world through the eyes of what Sam Huntington at Harvard called the war of civilizations between the Muslim civilization and the Western civilization. Because if we do, we will skew our policy in ways that will reinforce the very thing we want to avoid. Now, having said that, please understand there are significant elements of the Muslim world that want just that. And they are playing it out in terrorist attacks over a vast global playing field from Bali to Mali from Nigeria to Bulgaria just a few weeks ago, from Buenos Aires where, if you've ever visited EMEA and seen the center that was blown up there, to Southeast Asia, to the Chabad House in Mumbai. There are certainly hardcore jihadist elements who are trying to destroy Western civilization and the state of Israel in the process and create a radical Islamic caliphate. But in my opinion, this is a minority and a small minority, and the real war is not between the Western and Muslim civilizations, it's within the Muslim civilization. It's between Shiites and Sunnis, between modernizers and radicals, between jihadists and those who want to integrate their countries 
into the modern world. At the end of the day, we can help try to push this in a positive direction, but it's up to the Muslim world itself to come to terms with its own radicals. There are far more Muslims killed every week by other Muslims than Americans or Jews or Israelis by light years difference because these radicals want to upset and overturn more moderate Arab states. That's their initial target. Now, one of the problems is that the Arab Middle East in particular is highly dysfunctional by their own admission. There were two recent UN Arab Human Development Reports done not by Western scholars sort of looking condescendingly down on the Muslim world, but by their own scholars. And these are searing self-indictments of their incapacity to have non-corrupt governments, to create job and economic opportunities, to create innovation, to educate their young kids. And one seems like a sort of meaningless anecdote, but perhaps it, it typifies it. It mentions in this report that tiny Greece translates more books from other languages into Greece than the entire Arab Middle East translates books into Arabic. Now, this is a huge problem for all of us for the United States, for the West, for Israel, and for Jews, because there is an enormous youth bulge in these countries. A third of the entire Arab population is under 20 years of age. Over 40% of the Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza are under 20 years of age. This is a powder keg waiting to blow up, and in fact, it did. And that's what the Arab revolutions, I won't call them the Arab Spring, was all about. It was the effort at empowerment, at job opportunity, at economic opportunity, at decent non-corrupt governance. The problem is that the young people who brought these revolutions on in places like Egypt, the sort of Google social media kids, were very good at up overturning the Mubarak and other regimes, but utterly incapable, even to this very day with a parliamentary election next month in Egypt, of organizing themselves, of having a concrete agenda to present to their countries. And so, like physics, which abhors a vacuum, politics abhors a vacuum, and when a regime is blown up, something's going to fill that vacuum, and the, what's filled it was the only organized force waiting to come into power, the Islamic forces. And every election that's been held since the revolutions, with the ironic exception of Libya, has had an Islamic government elected. Now, mind you, even here, we don't want to paint with too broad a brush. I was in Morocco recently. The new Islamic government in Morocco and in Tunisia is very moderate. Its constitution is better than before the revolution, explicitly protects Jews by name in the constitution. But the key to the Arab world is Egypt. It's the largest country, the most powerful country. So goes Egypt, so goes the Arab Middle East in this new revolutionary era, which is rev as revolutionary in its impact as the communist fall in the 1990s was uh, to the world in Europe. So how does Egypt go? Well, it's quite clear that the Muslim Brotherhood, which has been in existence for uh, now 80 years, 1928, was waiting for this to happen. They were organized. They were providing the social services at the village level the government wasn't. They present an image of being clean, a non-corrupt, and they had an opposition with these secular groups that were, was totally shattered. And just yesterday, the secular opposition decided not even to contest 
the parliamentary elections, which they said were going to be corrupted by an unfair constitution. So we'd, we've got the Muslim Brotherhood whose progeny, whose children are Hamas in Gaza and the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan and Muslim Brotherhood organizations throughout the Arab Middle East. Now the question is, will the practicalities of governance moderate their radicalism? And I think the answer is there is some chance that that will happen. We're seeing some of it in Egypt because the president of Egypt, Morsi, and I was in the World Economic Forum in Davos just a month ago with my wife, and there were five Arab prime ministers on a panel, including the Egyptian prime minister. They know they've got to have Western and American investment if they're going to create the jobs that will keep them in power. A hundred U.S. business people recently came there. They need loans from the World Bank and the IMF, where we have a controlling vote. They need our technical assistance, and the administration's trying to get a billion dollar package together from Congress. So we're not without leverage, but we shouldn't fool ourselves. This is a different Middle East. It's a Middle East and an Egypt, which is much less willing to accept an American embrace, which is much more pro-Palestinian, which is going to keep the peace treaty with Egypt, but will keep Israel at a much further distance and which doesn't even control adequately its own Sinai border to prevent terrorists from leaking in from Gaza and going through northern Sinai to get to southern Israel. How do we deal with this phenomenon? How does the United States deal with it? We have no choice but to do what we're doing. We have to live with the reality and the cards that have been played. We have to reach out to these new Islamic governments. We have to provide technical assistance and military training and try to have as much leverage as we can have. And that's what's happening just yesterday with Secretary Kerry with Syria. To try now, and I think frankly belatedly, to have more of an influence on what a post assad Syria will have. We're going to still be major players in the region. We have to do so, however, with a very different set of people. Now, if I had time, I would deal with another issue, which is a new form of anti-Semitism uh, with the delegitimization of Israel, but let's, let's save that for the question period. I also deal in my book with what I call non-traditional security threats, environmental threats like climate change and the water crisis, which particularly hits Israel and the Middle East, cyber warfare, which is very deadly potentially, in part because you can trace a missile. You can't trace a cyber attack very easily. And because, and this is what I want to focus on in this topic, nuclear proliferation, in particular Iran. Iran is the greatest threat to Israel, both because of its support for terrorism and its budding nuclear program, and it is one of the greatest threats to the United States, to the Gulf states of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf Cooperation Council states, which are just as opposed as Israel to Iran having a nuclear weapon and to the Europeans. You know, as we speak, Iran has put in a new generation of centrifuges, some 2,800 in all, churning out enriched uranium, more and more of it at a 20% level that can be easily converted into weapon systems. They're working on nuclear triggers and other things that you don't need for a civilian nuclear program. And what do we do about this? The administration has gotten together, and I was responsible for sanctions policy in the Obama administration. You know, the Obama administration has gotten together the most profound, comprehensive, worldwide sanctions against Iran ever imposed on any country in peacetime. 
It's led to a 50% inflation rate, to a devaluation of their currency by 80%, to very significant disruption in their economy. Their private banks have been expelled from the so-called SWIFT system, which is the system that all banks need to clear transactions. They have to sell their oil through barter. They can't use dollars. The sanctions are working. The question is, are they working to stop the nuclear program in time? There are a new round of negotiations, the first in, in some nine months going on right now in Azerbaijan. What we must avoid, and the Iranians are masters of this, of dragging out these negotiations while they develop more and more nuclear fuel because we will reach a point shortly when there will be no point of return. Now in my estimation, 2013 will be the decisive year in which one of three things will happen. There'll be either a negotiated settlement in which they will agree to intrusive inspections and to getting this 20% enriched uranium out of their country and having it reprocessed in ways that aren't a threat for arms. Or, second, they will have crossed a line where they can't be stopped. That doesn't mean they'll have a bomb, but they'll be fully nuclear capable. They can take it off the shelf anytime they want, or there'll be war. Now, war is a very, very dramatic thing to consider. And one should not go into war without thinking of all the consequences. We've extricated ourselves from one bloody war in Iraq. We're in the process by 2014, next year, of extricating ourselves from a second in Afghanistan. There is no appetite by the American military and the American public for a third war in the region. And there's no such thing as an antiseptic war at 30,000 feet. There's, there'll be massive retaliation from Hezbollah with 50,000 rockets in Lebanon against Israel. If there's going to be war, it needs to come from the United States and our NATO allies, not from Israel. For Israel to precipitate this would be extraordinarily ris risky, unlikely to succeed because of the distances involved and the fact they don't have the heavy armaments that we do. The United States has assets very close to Iran. The question is, will we pull the trigger if we have to? Now this is a matter of great debate in Washington right now. And there are a growing number of policy experts in the proliferation of think tanks. We're great at think tanks. We don't produce a lot of other things that help the country. Uh, and more and more people are saying, well, look, uh, why can't we live with a nuclear Iran? We live with a nuclear Soviet Union for 50 years. And through mutually assured destruction, meaning that we would destroy them and they knew it, with a nuclear weapon if they ever tried to employ it against us, why not have a containment policy? Let Iran go forward and build a bomb and we will simply have mutually assured destruction. I think that's a mistake. I profoundly hope, profoundly hope the negotiations succeed. But if by the end of this year they do not, and there is at least a 50% chance they will not. In my opinion, every other form, whether it's cyber attacks or, or more traditional efforts, should be used to disrupt their nuclear program. Now, why do I say that with all the risks attendant? I say that because if there isn't this, if Iran can get by with ignoring five unanimous UN Security Council resolutions, which even the Chinese and Russians agreed to, that they are to stop enri enriching uranium. 
It will blow up the whole Security Council system. It will shred what's left of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I can tell you for a certainty that Saudi Arabia and Qatar and other countries in the region are not going to let Iran be the only Muslim country with a bomb, excluding Pakistan. They're not going to allow it. It'll start a whole nuclear arms race in the very region Israel abides in, which will create an incredibly unstable Middle East. In addition, it will embolden Iran, which is already the chief supporter of terrorism around the world, to feel that they have a nuclear umbrella under which they can encourage even more terrorist acts. Now again, I hope we're not faced with that stark task. But if we are, this is where I come down. The key is trust. I believe that Israel has now convinced itself it should not attack itself, which was not the case last summer. But interestingly, and it was a very healthy debate in a de democratic Israel, where when it, the prime minister and the defense minister began talking openly about Israeli attacks, you had the former heads of the Mossad, three, four, five former heads, the former heads of the military saying Israel should not do this we have to rely on the U.S., but that's where trust comes in. That's the key issue, to convince the Israeli public and the government that the United States can be trusted, as the president has repeatedly said, that for Iran to have a nuclear weapon is unacceptable, and that we, the United States, will take all means necessary to prevent it. Israel has to trust that. Now, that's a big ask because you're asking a sovereign country facing an existential threat to rely on a third country to support that. But I believe that we can be trusted, and again, I think the consequences of Israel acting unilaterally are profoundly bad. But this will be the decisive year. Now, I want to conclude by talking about internal challenges. I think we the United States and Israel and the Jewish people can meet all of these global forces as challenging as they are because Jews and Israel are not alone. These are all challenges that the West faces, that the United States faces, and that Israel can help embed itself into the Western world in ways that will not isolate Israel and Jews in meeting these challenges. The internal challenges are different. Many of you may not be old enough to remember the old Al Cap Pogo cartoon in which he said, we have met the enemy and it is us. Now think of this. In 1939, before World War II, there were 17 million Jews and a population of 2 billion. Today, there are 13 and a half million Jews and a population of 7 billion. And by the end of this century, there will, if we're lucky, be 17 million Jews in a world of 10 billion. I want you to think about the internal situation in the United States among American Jews as a corporation or an enterprise with five million shareholders, of which we're a part. But it's an enterprise with two divisions. There's a very healthy, vibrant division, which is roughly 50% of this enterprise. You're all part of it. We see an enormous proliferation of cultural and religious and artistic and political expression in ways no one could have imagined day schools proliferating, 750 day schools, not just Orthodox. In Atlanta, Georgia, where I grew up, I never thought I would see the day there's a reform Jewish day school, a vibrant reform Jewish day school in Atlanta, educating in total over 200,000 Jewish kids a year in the United States. But the other division of this enterprise is bankrupt and threatening the health of the entire enterprise. 
So we are in a demographic bind. We are under replacement values levels for our population. To just keep level with a population, families have to have an average of 2.1 kids per family. I wouldn't like to be the one-tenth of 1% 1 who's the kid, but on average, that's what you have. We are 1.8. European Jews are 1.5. So we can't even stay level at that birth rate. And then when you add the fact that over 50% of all new Jewish marriages are with a non-Jewish spouse and in less than 10% of the cases does the non-Jewish spouse convert to Judaism, roughly the same percentage, by the way, that the Jewish spouse converts out of the religion in mixed marriages, you have a very serious demographic problem. And you have to have a critical mass of people to be influential, to keep our traditions, to keep that healthy division going. All of our children and grandchildren, all of them, every one of them, even if they're born to all Jewish marriages, will be Jews by choice, not just Jews by birth. Because we have made it we are integrated. We are totally assimilated. Our young kids can do anything they want through social media, through travel, through college, through education. They meet everyone, Chinese and Vietnamese, and who knows who they will marry because they'll be stationed in Hong Kong or in Sao Paulo. And so this 21st century world is a world we have made it in. The question is, can we survive our own success in it? And I call in, in my book for really some dramatic steps to try to address this. For example, that all Jewish organizations, whether it's AJC or synagogues, should embrace mixed marriage couples, even if they haven't converted. Bring them into the fold. Make them feel welcome. Show them the beauties of Judaism and Jewish history and Jewish culture and not make them feel estranged. I also think that non-Orthodox rabbis should perform intermarriages when the non-Jewish spouse, even if he or she hasn't converted pledges, as many do, to raise their kids as Jewish and you find over time, in many cases, they're more serious about Judaism than their Jewish spouse. This is a critical time in an intermarried couple's life. They're just coming together as a couple, and they go shopping from one rabbi to another to find someone to marry them. What good does it do to have them go down to the, corny, the, the county courthouse to have their marriage? We need to have more proactive conversion. It's so difficult to convert. I mean, the first thing you're asked is, why do you want to do this? Do you really want to be Jewish? I mean, it's like we were living in the 18th century in a shtetl in Europe. And Jewish education is critical. We need to create a multi-billion dollar Jewish educational endowment to lower the cost of day school education because day school education is the best way in which to preserve Jewish identity, but it is incredibly expensive. Where my kids went to Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School in suburban Washington, $25,000. I mean, this is not Harvard for, you know, high school, for, for pre-college. So if you've got three, four kids, who can afford that? And we have to promote proven successes. And there are proven successes. Operation Birthright, which was started by Michael Steinhardt and Charles Bronfman, is an incredible success. Kids 18 to 26 who have never been to Israel get a free trip, 10 days. There's a new study by Leonard Sachs at Brandeis, my, my wife's uh, college. And it shows dramatic additional attachments by those kids from just that 10-day period. 
less intermarriage, and when there is intermarriage, much more conversion. And yet there are waiting lists of 20,000 a year because there's not enough funding. We need to strengthen Hillel chapters on campuses to help be a magnet for Jewish kids. Now I want to close by talking about the Israeli perspective of this internal capacity and talk about demographics from a very different way. Again, going back to 1960, 1939 when there were 16 to 17 million Jews, only 3% of world Jews lived in what was then Palestine. Today, 43% of world Jews live in Israel. More Jews live in Israel than in any country in the world, including the United States. A plurality of Jews live in Israel, not in the United States. And their birth rates, let's take aside the Haredi, even the secular birth rates are far greater than ours, about three per couple. And so that gap is going to grow. And that means there's a new paradigm to the diaspora-Israel relationship. We have been and we should continue to be moral, political, financial supporters of Israel. But they're not some fledgling, weak state. We have our own problems now. We need their help as they become the senior partners in this relationship. And they're just coming around to realize that. Because they understand if there's not a core of strong American and European Jews, the support for Israel is at risk in the countries where they need it. And so, for example, with Operation Birthright, for the first time just two or three years ago, the Israeli government has put in about 100 million shekels of uh, Israeli taxpayer money, not because they think these kids from 10 days are going to make Aliyah, but because they realize that by creating a greater attachment to Judaism in the United States and Europe, it will create stronger support for Israel with the young generation. Now, Israel has its own demographic. The Haredi or ultra-Orthodox are 8% of the population. They'll be 15% within 15 years. They don't work. They don't pay taxes. They don't serve in the army. And this is unsustainable. That's what the election that just happened in Israel was all about. That's why the new Lapid party of total, totally new, I mean, one thing about Israel, you can just create a party overnight. And Lapid did, and he got 19 seats, second largest. Why? Because he, and interestingly, an ultra-Orthodox, but I should say an ultra-nationalist, Naftali Bennett, who's on the other side on settlements, had the same policy. They called it burden sharing. That it's not any longer possible for the secular forces to support the yeshivas, to support kids working, studying all their lives, not paying taxes, not being integrated into society. 50% of the school kids in the first grade in Israel are either the children of Arabs or Haredi. And the geopolitical dimension of this is that in my estimation, it's not possible for 5.7 million Israeli Jews to control the lives of over 2 million Palestinians in the West Bank more in Gaza, and almost 200,000 in East Jerusalem. If we want a Jewish majority state, which we should, we've got to find a way of dealing with this, not as a gift to the Palestinians, but as an essential ingredient for a Jewish majority state that has democratic values. Now, how do you do this with a Palestinian population and government, which in Abba Ibn's famous words, never loses an opportunity to lose an opportunity. And which even more than that, 
and I've negotiated a half dozen times with Arafat during the during the Clinton administration because I was in charge of the, the economic dimension of the peace process, they're not prepared today to come to terms with what they have to come to terms with, like the law of return, uh, with a very weak and divided leadership and with Hamas on the sidelines trying to blow up anything that the Palestinian Authority does. So how do you deal with this dilemma when there's a greater and greater projection of settlements more and more into greater areas of the territories making a two-state solution almost impossible within the next two or three years if something's not done about it. When on the other hand you have Palestinians who aren't negotiating partners. So my suggestion is the political equivalent of the medical Hippocratic Oath. Do no harm. If you can't cure the patient, don't make the patient worse. And that means there's going to be an expansion of settlements. People have babies. But they should expand within existing settlement blocks that we all know in any peace agreement will go back to Israel anyway. But stop the projection of these outposts, a hundred of them, that are illegal even under Israeli law. And with the expansion of settlements into new areas that will simply complicate it. These are two people who need to be separated at this point. Now, I will tell you from listening even this very week to military intelligence experts from Israel that if the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank collapses, and it could well, if it collapses, it will be catastrophic for Israel because Israel will have to take over all the security on the West Bank, all the civilian needs on the West Bank, all the education on the West Bank. And the Palestinian Authority is cooperating. Don't take my word, take the head of the Mossad and the head of the Israeli military intelligence. They cooperate in finding militants and allowing the Israelis to capture them. None of that will happen if there's no Palestinian Authority and there's no recognition, in my opinion, in Israel or even in Washington of the urgency of supporting a really floundering Palestinian Authority at a time when Hamas is tooting its horn over Gaza. Israel has to come to a terms itself after six decades with very fundamental problems. Not the United States telling it. These are fundamental issues. Where does Israel want its eventual borders to be? What does Israel want its relationship to be with its one and a half million Israeli Arab citizens? Is it what the chief rabbi of Safat said last year? No landlord should rent any apartment to any Israeli Arab. And what does Israel ultimately want its relationship to be with the Palestinians it controls? They have to answer these questions and they have to answer them quickly. Now having said all of that, I have to say that with all the challenges, with all the challenges, I'm optimistic about the future and I'm optimistic because of where we've come from, how far we've come. We have a state after 2,000 years that's one of the strongest, most innovative, most creative, has one of the top 10 militaries in the world. We've got a base of at least 50% of the diaspora population, like yourselves, that are deeply engaged in wanting to transmit our religion and our values to the next generation and generations thereafter. We have fulfilled in our own lifetime what the prophet Jeremiah prophesied after the destruction of the first temple in 586 BC, in which he envisioned in his words I will gather them for the uppermost parts of the world, the blind and the lame among them, women with child and women in travail. A great company 
shall come back there, and they have in our own lifetime. All the empires which sought to destroy the Jewish people, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, the Greeks and the Romans, the Tsars and the Soviets and the Communists, have themselves been assigned to the ash heap of history, and we, the Jewish people, are still here, and we're going to be here forever. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.